Well, we could certainly make the argument that tonight's video ranks in the top five as, um, as far as importance goes. Uh, it's a very, very difficult topic when it comes to finding the correct bounds on some of these problems. It's very difficult to visualize the graphs at times. And I don't know if we've had less practice with any other topic than this one right here uh, when you consider how challenging it is. But anyway, uh, the, our area formula is, of course, one half the integral. We're going to say the lower bound is alpha, the upper bound is beta. And then what we're doing is we're taking the r and we're squaring it. And, of course, the integral is with respect to theta. So just double-check your notation. Make sure you agree with all that. And basically, what we want to do is we want to visualize some radial lines today, um, a.k.a. wiper blades. Um, when we talk about the wiper blades, the pivot point is sitting right on the pole. And then that wiper blade is rotating and sweeping counterclockwise throughout the curve, whether it's a limicon or a rose petal or whatever. And like always, 99% of our energy is going to be put into getting the correct bounds. Um, there's, you know, certainly no other students uh, throughout the country are going to have trouble, uh, you know, putting the R in there. It's all about the bounds, getting the correct bounds. And we're going to finish with a big bang. The last slide is going to be the area between two polar curves, which kind of has its own twists and turns to it as well. Well, I wanted to try something different here. I was trying to brainstorm and, and think of a different approach. And, and I think I came up with a, a fairly interesting idea, and I'm interested to see if this helps and, and whatnot. But I want, you to, I want you to draw the curve. R equals the cosine of theta. I want you to draw it three separate times. I want you to have three distinct um, you know, uh, graphs for R equals cosine. They don't have to be huge by any means, but uh, you know, take up four or five lines in your notebook and whatnot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an integral uh, I'm going to give you three different integrals, and uh, for each of the integrals, I'm going to have you shade in on your drawings how much area or what area is being represented by the integral. So for part A, the first one that you draw, I want you to take a look at this integral, one-half integral from zero, upper bound pi over two, and I'll work on my handwriting here. So that's supposed to be a pi over two for the upper bound, and we're taking the cosine of theta and we're squaring it. So that's the first drawing. I want you to shade in that one. Uh, for part B, I want you to do one half integral from pi over 4 all the way to 3 pi over 4. That's kind of an interesting one. Cosine of theta squared. So you notice I'm really not trying to be tricky with, you know, I've got the one half out in front every time. I've, I've got the function being squared each time. What I really want you to focus in on the bounds and drawing correlations um, with the graph and where those bounds are. And then the, the last one, I want you to go 0 to pi for cosine of theta squared. Okay, so go ahead, take a moment, hit the pause button, and see if you can uh, shade in the appropriate regions for each of these three. Oh my goodness, thank goodness I was able to hit the pause button to draw those three. That took me about an hour and a half to draw those three. That was a disaster. Oh my goodness gracious. Anyway, um, the blue one here, the top one, the uh, wiper blade started at R equals zero, or I should say theta equals zero. I'm going to grab a different color here. Okay. So we're starting right here, and that wiper blade is sweeping counterclockwise until I hit pi over two. So I'm starting there, 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 sweeping, sweeping, sweeping. And once I get perfectly vertical up and down, I hit pi over two. So I'm going to say that top half is the first integral. On the second one, I got to find pi over four. Now remember, draw a perfect diagonal line that splits that first quadrant in half, and we'll say that's pi over four. We're going to rotate counterclockwise here, here, here. That's pi over two. Now what I want you to do is we'll kind of fast forward. Let's draw another diagonal line that's going to split the third or the fourth quadrant in half, and we'll say that's three pi over four. So we're kind of down in there. So we got those two um, odd wedge-shaped th things going on there. Um, and then the last one. We're going to start at zero. We're going to go all the way. Let's see, that's so far as pi over two. And this right here is pi. Oops, sorry about that, Fode. Uh, you can blame that one on Chafee. That's all his fault. Uh, anyway, just a quick comment on the circle here. This is one of the rare polar graphs where it only takes pi radians to complete a cycle. So integrating from zero to pi here did gobble up all of the area inside that circle. All right, I want to play, take a similar strategy here on the next slide. I've given you a new curve, r equals 1 plus 2 sine of theta. So instantly, I, I'm hoping you're able to uh, visualize a rough sketch of that graph in your mind. And I've given you three new integrals as well, and I want you to draw three separate graphs for the same curve, and to, on each of those to shade in the appropriate area represented by each of these integrals. Again, um, exercise a great deal of self-discipline here. Hit that pause button and challenge yourself, and see um, how strong you feel with this topic. 
Okay, we had a limit count with an inner loop because the 2 is bigger than the, the 1 here. It was symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And uh, I said that the inner loop began at 7 pi over 6 and then it ended at 11 pi over 6. Um, so anyway, the first integral, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a radial line at 0. And it's, it's going to, um, the wiper blade is going to sweep around the outer rim of that curve. Remember, the pivot point is going to remain at the origin. So what it is going to actually do is it's going to gobble up everything including what appears to be you know the inner loop itself so it's just everything we're getting right there until we hit pi so it's not getting the only thing it's not getting is those two little dimples at the bottom it's basically getting everything that's above the x-axis now a second one here we're starting at pi over three which is about 60 degrees so i'm going to picture a radial line right there and then we're going to rotate it counterclockwise until I hit 7 pi over 6 which is actually uh, the beginning of that inner loop so we're right here let's see we hit pi over 2 right now uh, that's about 3 pi over 4 we keep going we hit pi and just go a little beyond pi and you're going to gobble up at that little uh, cheek underneath the x-axis. So that's the region right there. We did not re-enter that inner loop. We just got up to the starting point. And then the very last one here, we want to start at 3 pi over 2, which is actually 3 pi over 2 is right up here. So I want you to, your radial line's right there. We're going to, um, we're going to rotate counterclockwise again. And what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to exit that loop we're going to get this little section here, and guess, let's see, uh, oh yeah, and two pies right there. So kind of a weird shape. We got half the inner loop and then the little cheek on the right side that's underneath the x-axis. All right, one more similar exercise, and I'm going to actually leave this one all up to you, and then it'll give me something to come around and check in your notebook tomorrow. I'm going to be looking for the three different drawings to represent the blue, the green, and this light blue um, area. So draw the curve, R equals... 2 plus cosine and uh, shade in the appropriate region. So the uh, first one, is, the bounds are 0 to 3 pi over 2. The green guy, the bounds are pi over 3 all the way up to 5 pi over 4. And then the last one, I think you'll really appreciate this upper bound, a nice little challenge here. But anyway, the lower bound's pi and the upper bound is 13 pi over 6. So I'm interested to see how comfortable you feel with that one. So go ahead, draw those three and I'll check them tomorrow. Well, we've cooked up a real challenging one here for you in our first multiple choice example. And, uh, you know, we've studied like the real common curves, but I always want you to be prepared for a rascal that maybe you haven't seen before. Um, this is actually falls into the, and I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing this correctly, the Leminiscent family. And uh, it kind of makes like a figure eight. And the cosine ones are, of course, uh, symmetric with respect to the x-axis. And the, uh, the sine ones would be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. But anytime you meet a curve like this that you're not quite used to, you know, don't be afraid to start creating a table of values. Pick friendly values of theta. Pick a zero. If you plug in zero, the cosine of zero is one, ten. And, and then don't forget to take the square root. Solve for r. The r value would be radical ten. I also chose 30 degrees, which is pi over 6. If you double that angle, you'll get uh, 60 degrees. Uh, cosine of 60 is a half. Half of 10 is 5, so I got radical 5. Uh, pi over 4 was a very special one because if you double it, you get 90. That's 0. Now, what happens is once you go beyond pi over 4, so for instance, try pi over 2. If you double pi over 2, you get pi. Cosine of pi is negative, and you can't take the square root of a negative, so you start getting non-existent numbers. So what's happening here is I've just, if I just plot the... Four or the three points I've created, 0, radical 10 would be right here, pi over 6, radical 5, and then pi over 4, comma 0. So what I'm getting in that order right there, I'll put a little arrow, is I'm getting basically the first uh, quarter part of the figure 8. Uh, the rest of the graph then, let me change colors here lightly, the rest of the graph would boomerang this way, this way, and then finish in the fourth quadrant. So that's what the Leminiscent looks like. Um, here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go one half. I'm going to integrate from zero to pi over four. All right, and I'm going to now. Oh, here's the cool part. All you got to do is throw ten cosine of two theta there. You actually don't want the squared sign because the r was already getting squared. So don't don't square that quantity. That would be a big no no. So anyway, the integral I have just represents this section that's living in the first quadrant. What I want to do is I want to multiply by four because there was three other congruent sections. So I've got two outside times ten. I'm going to pull out the twenty integral from zero to pi over four. 
And now we've got to get the correct antiderivative. Uh, let's see. Try to do the u sub in your head. So I've got, let's see, I pull out a one half. I get 10 sine of 2 theta by the time I finish my u sub from 0 to pi over 4. Uh, plug in the pi over 4, I get 10. If I plugged in the 0, I got 0. So I went back up here. My final answer was 10, choice A. Well, there's something tremendously friendly about this problem. And, and uh, like on the first slide, we said we're going to put 99% of our energy into the bounds. Well, the moment you read this question, boom, right there, they told you what they wanted the bounds to be. And every once in a while, we've seen one like that on the AP where they're very upfront and forward about that. Uh, so here's the trick. If the bounds are so easy, there's got to be a catch, right? They wouldn't make this problem that easy. Well, the bottom line is we've got to get the R by itself. If you solve for R, you're going to get 1 over cosine of 1 half theta, which is equivalent to saying secant of 1 half of theta. So there's your R value. And this time, we actually do have to take that, wrap it up, and square it. So here's what we're integrating, folks. We are actually trying to integrate secant squared of 1 half theta. And so that's actually pretty friendly. Now, by the time you let u equal the inner function right here, the 1 half theta, you're going to get a, um, a coefficient of 2, which when multiplied by that 1 half, it gives you 1. Now, the antiderivative of secant squared is going to be tangent of your inner function with bounds of 0 to pi over 2. If I plug in a pi over 2, I get tangent of pi over 4, which is 1, and the tangent of 0 is 0, so I like choice D. Well, this is the big bear we've been waiting for tonight, the area in between two curves. And so we've really got to put our thinking caps on here and, and take something away from this problem. First thing I want you to do is take your time, hit the pause button here, and get these two curves sketched um, and you know make them appropriate size-wise. And let's try to find the intersection points and try to get our mind wrapped around this one. And feel free to go as far as you want. And then once you get stuck, come on back, hit play, and, and pick up the rest of the pieces. Well, things are pretty intense on this particular problem. Um, I had a circle with a diameter of 3 symmetric with respect to the y-axis. I did that in green. And then I had a nice cardioid, and I did that in a very light blue. And um, let's see what I got here. I want to find the area that's, uh, let's see, inside the green guy, but outside the light blue guy. So I'm picturing I got an intersection right here. I'm going to draw that radial line. I had my second intersection over here. Again, draw that radial line. And it should be more symmetric than what my picture illustrates. Uh, but nonetheless, what I want that radial line to do is it's going to start right here, and we're going to sweep counterclockwise. And I want to gobble up all this area right here. Now, here's the number one thing I need from you. It's not like the area between two rectangular curves where you just go outer minus inner, and that's it. The squaring makes this totally different. And what I need you to do is I need you to use two integrals right now. Just trust me on this one. We need to use two integrals. And so basically what I want to do is I want to find all the area inside the green guy. And then I want to subtract all the area inside the light blue guy. And by the time I execute that subtraction, I'll be left with just the stuff that's in between them. Now as far as the bounds go, let's set the two functions equal to each other. Hopefully you've already done that and you've come up with the certain bounds. And I'm just going to walk through that really quick. If I said 3 sine of theta was equal to 1 plus sine of theta, subtract that sine over and then divide by 2, let's see, my first intersection point would be, let's see, 30 degrees is pi over 6, and then this one would be 150, also known as 5 pi over 6. So let's go from integral pi over 6, and of course there are some shortcuts to this. We could make the upper bound of pi over 2 and then double our answer to kill the coefficient, uh, but this first one's just going to be 3 sine of theta quantity squared. And then over here I've got the same bounds for now. Let's see, 5 pi over 6. I'm going to take the, uh, the light blue curve, 1 plus sine, also known as the cardioid square, that guy. All right, now, once you get those two integrals written down, now we can shorten this up a little bit. Uh, we could combine these into two. We could say 1 half integral from pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. And then we could say 3 sines of theta squared minus quantity 1 plus sine of theta squared. But notice each quantity is getting squared individually. It kind of, and I, I, and I hesitate to even draw this correlation, but it kind of reminds me of a washer problem uh, when we were doing revolutions. And of course there's, uh, you know, we're not revolving here, so I, you know, I probably shouldn't have even made that connection. But the point is that each of the curves are getting squared separately because we had to find the area inside each of them 
individually first and then subtract them. The other uh, twist we said is we could change the upper bound to be a pi over 2, which would then kill that coefficient in front and then do the same subtraction there uh, of those two functions. So hope you're feeling pretty strong with these uh, pullers. Don't forget to fill in that one question that was about halfway through the lesson tonight, and we'll check those tomorrow.